All right. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining our discussion today on why the textile industry is relying on certification now more than ever. My name is Ryan Daly. I work in our sustainability group here at NSF International. A few quick notes as folks are still joining. As attendees, you are in listen-only mode, but that doesn't mean we don't want your input. Please use uh, the panel in your webinar uh, platform to submit any questions you have throughout the session and we'll direct them towards our panel at the end of the discussion. Uh, and yes, a recording will be available in the coming days and sent out to all registrants as, a as well as uh, posted on our website. Uh, to get things started, I want to start out with a quick poll um, to gauge um, what uh, is the uh, biggest concern when it comes to uh, implementing certification at your organization. Uh, you can select as many as are relevant to your concerns, but that's going to help guide our discussion uh, with our panel of experts um, later on in the session. So. Uh, just give you a couple more seconds to, uh, for everyone to get their input in. Looks to be pretty evenly split. I will uh, share that. I think uh, you all can see that now. Uh, pretty evenly split between costs, understanding meeting customer demands, implementing adaptations in light of COVID and utilizing technology. So we will uh, make sure to factor that in as we're moving through. All right. So a quick introduction to NSF for those not uh, familiar with us. NSF is a uh, global independent not-for-profit non-governmental organization with a mission and focus on protecting and improving human health and the environment. I want to introduce our expert panel. Uh, I'm going to give them all a chance to introduce themselves and their organizations and the projects they're working on. Uh, I'm also going to ask them to turn their video on now so you can put a face to the voice. Uh, I'll start with Ashley Gill from the Textile Exchange and move through the list. So Ashley, take it away. Which I think you might be on mute still. Yes, I am. Sorry about that. Um, I'm Ashley Gill. I'm the Director of Standards at Textile Exchange. First of all, thank you so much to the NSF team for having me here. I'm really happy to be a part of this. Um, textile Exchange is a nonprofit organization. We work on sustainability in the textile space, mostly focusing on fibers and materials. And we own and manage several of the industry standards on that verify organically grown content, recycle content, uh, and responsible animal welfare in down, wool, and mohair. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks. Great, thanks. What you, Matthew? Hey there, uh, Matthew Betcher here. I'm the Creative and Marketing Director of Allied <clears throat> Feather and Down. Um, for decades, we've been at the forefront of trying to establish traceability um, and transparency within an incredibly complex supply chain, uh, which is down. And uh, thank you again for allowing us to join. I think this is a really exciting opportunity to start conversations about how we employ current technologies, future technologies, um, and help make uh, these standards, which are incredibly important and seem to be increasingly important, uh, help make them more efficient as we, uh, as we move through, uh, through this. Great, thanks. Kieran? Uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks to Matthew, Steve, and the panelists for inviting me on. Uh, it's, it's always good to have a nerd on the panel, so uh, I guess uh, that's me for today. So I'm a technologist um, uh, and uh, I am one of the managing partners in Genesis. Um, I have the pleasure of working with NSF on how to utilise technology, people and process to actually help address some of the 
concerns and some of the objectives that the panel have set out today and certainly some of the occupants um, through trust, traceability and transparency and helping organisations utilise technology such as, as blockchain and artificial intelligence um, to drive uh, this new trust economy. Awesome, thanks. Anna, Eugene. Hi, uh, I'm Jean Hagenis, and again, pleasure to be here as with all the other panelists. Um, I'm the sustainability director for the Lycra company. We uh, have been producing Lycra fiber for over 60 years, and we also have other products such as Coolmax and Thermalite, and we're moving a lot of these products into more sustainable solutions. So um, great to be a part of the panel. Awesome. Thanks, Gene. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Jeff, our moderator. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Hi, everybody. I'm Jeff Wilson, Senior Business Development Manager at NSF for the Sustainability Division. And I lead a team uh, that markets and sells our whole portfolio of sustainability services uh, at NSF. And my specific background and expertise is in apparel, footwear, home textiles, 14 years on the brand side, and then three great years with Textile Exchange and Ashley and, and her team, and now three years with, with NSF. So really excited to, to be here and moderate this stellar panel and look forward to the discussion. So uh, back to you shortly. Thanks, Ryan, back to you. Great, thanks. Um, and with that, Jeff, I'm gonna um, let you set the stage before we get into our panel discussion. Okay, great. Yep. All right. Um, there were a lot of motivations behind getting this um, this together, you guys. And I think probably the biggest one was uh, obviously COVID and certainly the difficulties and challenges that it's created on the entire system and, and our industry. And I think I know speaking for myself and, and my background, like I mentioned, you know, we a lot of us have been working on this for a long time and we've made, I mean, significant progress in all the work that we were doing and it was really really exciting to see and it still is but needless to say covid threw a wrench into the works a bit um even though i felt like we were at a tipping point and you know the the standards of certification have, have been part and parcel of all of that work and really important in hitting on a number of these things you can read this the slide there i'm not going to go into it from more resilient supply networks to uh sustainability goals uh, that many have set, particularly in terms of adoption of preferred fibers, um, renewing our commitment to a sustainable future, and of course, how technology can influence things. So, um, you know, I think, you know, we wait, next next slide, please, Ryan. Um, you know, there are a number of, number of drivers behind trying, I think, our goal to get, to keep the momentum going. Um, you know, again, as I mentioned, the adoption of the standards has been pretty much off the chart, and Ashley can probably speak to that a little bit, but between GOTS and the GRS and the animal welfare standards, the last number of years have just been really, really phenomenal growth. And so our goal today is, is, is to try and help reinforce the idea that we can't, we shouldn't be giving up. We need to almost double down. You've heard that. It's a bit of a cliche, but let's not lose the momentum. And certainly, you know, a, a, a very big driver of this is is on the consumer side. And I think coming out of out of COVID, uh, and Kieran mentioned this, you know, there is just going to continue to be a greater need, a greater desire for trust, transparency, and traceability as we go through this. People are going to want to know where their stuff is made, how it's made, who's making it. And all those things really, really click into the system of certification and so we want to make sure that that as we move forward this system has a lot of positive benefits a lot of positive outcomes and our goal today is to try and reinforce that but also to explore to take this important moment in time where things are so radically changing that we do take an innovative look at the system and and and, and have some important conversations about how we can make it better and i think when we look at the slide there you know, number one was cost and efficiency. So how can we make the system more affordable? How can we make it more efficient? How can we make it more credible? How can we make it more trustworthy? So hopefully that sets the stage a little bit. 
don't want to take any more time. Want to dive right into the discussion. So, uh, panel, thank you. Look forward to, uh, to our conversation. Um, all right. Question one on the supply chain complexity side. I'm going to direct this. Uh, you know, Matthew, first to you, and then Ashley, of course, uh, with transaction certificates. So, transaction certificates are an essential part of the integrity system, and we use in the industry the TE standards. We'd agree. I think everybody knows that there's a fair amount of variability in all the things that support that you can read what's there uh, about this and generally making it a little inefficient confusing and complex for all the practitioners that are out there and including certification bodies so what parts of the transaction system do you see as needing to remain and what do you see as most important to transform and how so again matthew maybe you can kick it off and actually i know it, your important voice too so thank you go ahead matthew thanks jeff um, yeah, it's 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 interesting. I think starting uh, starting with me here for the transaction certificates, um, our supply chain is is incredibly complex, and I think it it both highlights the success of transaction certificate uh, system, but also some of the shortcomings. Um, and you know, it, in terms of success, it's it's an incredibly reliable um, system in terms of. Um, uh, authentication. Um, where we see issues is working with a supply chain such as ours, where we rely on several slaughterhouse groups to procure the material, who rely on several farms, if not several dozen farms each. And, and you can see as it sort of grows through that, through that system, every step along the way, there's a bit of variability. And, and by the time that material is going out and it's sort of like what we, you know, final TC from us, um, you know, the, the variability could account for um, several large uncertified farms to enter the network um, of certified material. Um, and that's kind of where, where we're looking at to help improve um, by utilizing technology, whether it's, uh, whether it's a, uh, <clears throat> a, um, topical tagant or uh, or whatever getting that as far upstream as possible to help reduce um, to help reduce some of this cost and fatigue because in the end uh, somebody's going to have to pay for all of these transaction certificates um, and currently it's a, it's a case of we're having to pass on some of those costs to our customers our brands uh, we're having to eat a lot of those costs as well um, and then it's a matter of value. Um, everybody understands the need for these certifications, but then what's the value in the end? Um, as complicated as our supply chain is, so is working with, with a lot of the brands out there where uh, compliance directors, compliance teams are pushing for the use of these standards, but when it gets time to actually negotiating the cost of material, um, that, becomes a, that becomes an issue. Um, you know, and so from from our our perspective, we're we're just looking at ways to make the entire system more efficient. I don't think transaction certificates are are going anywhere. Um, it's a it's kind of a balance, right? Like with our with our supply chain, it's an incredibly uh, old supply chain and remote supply chain, and so things like complete blockchain, um, it's just really not possible. Um, even just from the basic uh, the basic sense that most of these farms don't have access to the internet. Um, you know, certain simple things that I think a lot of times we are, are proceeding down these paths with a bit of tunnel vision and we need to understand, you know, sometimes this isn't possible um, to include this level of technology, but how can we incorporate technology to make things more efficient to give a higher level of authenticity, make it easier for brands to, yep. um, you know, to 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 yeah. adopt and 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 really bring more value to the to the consumer because in the end the consumer is driving this. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. And I and I know these these issues are going to cross cut, so you'll have more to say uh, coming ahead on some of this. I know, but actually, um, I know you guys are working on it, the CDS and some other thoughts. I know you have, so please. Sure. So the transaction certificates are part of Textile Exchange's content claim standard, which is how we do chain of custody for all of our standards. 
And Matthew is right. They, they work essentially on the basis of starting at the raw material and then working through to provide validation to the customer. So it's really a, a, a hallmark of the chain of custody system. Without the transaction certificates, you don't really have that product level uh, verification. So to that extent, you know, we don't we're, we don't see those as as being replaced or going away. What we are looking at is a, a couple of different places where we think there's an opportunity to make them more efficient. Um, primarily, I mean, I guess first of all, using a more digital system where it's possible to um, to collect some of that information in a more automatic way that you have maybe going into a system that can help with the volume reconciliation. A big part of the just how manually intensive transaction certificates are right now is that everybody is manually submitting this information. The certification bodies are manually reviewing every single one and then manually reporting that back to the sites. And there's a lot of efficiency, I think, to be gained even if we don't, even if a site doesn't have the ability to submit their data digitally, they could still put it into a more kind of centralized system. Um, so those are, you know, those are the kind of, of innovations that we're looking at, keeping everything Matthew had in, said in mind of every, the supply chain is all in different places. And if you want to create a system that works and that can level the playing field for everyone, you have to keep all of those different systems um, in mind. The other thing that we um, are, are kind of looking at is, is harmonization and making sure that whenever people enter information in, that that information can be compared to what another entity is, is doing. And as we have a lot of different certification bodies and a lot of different sites operating in a lot of different countries, a big piece of the work that Textile Exchange is doing as we develop and roll out this database to store all of the information is to make sure that we're doing a really good job of synthesizing and uh, defining terms and narrowing you know if you if you call something yarn or you call something um, fabric that you have like really specific definitions those are probably bad examples I guess everybody knows what those are um, but that that kind of you would think that maybe that's not really that big of a deal but when you start looking at all of the different materials all of the different types of supply chains all the different terms that float around it's, it can be really difficult so that's one of the one of the big areas that we're looking at uh, right now but we do think there's a lot of opportunity in, in digital systems, uh, looking at more at product level or article level validation rather than batch level validation. Um, and then I think these other technologies that, that Matthew mentioned, another way that they can be harnessed for efficiency is, un, is using them to understand risk. And if you're, if you're managing risk in that way and you're kind of layering on these additional physical tracers that currently our certification doesn't include, and you can use that to say, hey, actually, this is a lower risk site because they have this other system in place. Maybe we can reduce their auditing. Maybe we can reduce the, you know, the, the checks in place. That's going to create efficiency opportunities for everybody in the supply chain. Um, so those are the kind of, yeah, well, the timing of this is fantastic. We're going into a revision of the content claim standard really soon. So I'm taking yeah. really good notes. <laughs> good. Hey, I knew this was going to get troublesome, you guys, just in terms of timing. And these each of these subjects could go on for a long time. And and so I, I, I have to be the, the taskmaster so we can get everybody involved and cover the different subjects. So Matthew, Ashley, thanks very much. Uh, Ryan, next slide, please. Uh, next question. Yes. Yeah, so, um, this really has to do with on-site and remote audits, which we've come to grips with here in the last two months due to COVID. But one of those things where, how can we learn from this and what are we learning along the way in terms of remote audits, whether it's documentation or whether it's technology and streaming, uh, you know, uh, Google Glass, uh, FaceTime, whatever it may be. Gina, I wanna direct this question to you because you've been through this recently uh, with us. So what has been your experience uh, relative to remote audits versus on-site audits, and um, can you help us kind of think about that uh, that experience as well as leveraging that into uh, moving forward? Jean, thank sure. you. Sure, sure. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I guess most recently we've just completed three GRS audits, and two of those were in person, and one due to COVID was done remotely. Um, I guess. 
you know, my first comment would be that essentially, I think the auditor in all three cases, the auditors were able to achieve exactly what they wanted. So I didn't feel in any way that having the audit done remotely was, you know, compromised anything. So, so I think that's, that's a, a positive. Um, I would say the challenges that we faced around the remote audit, um, this was an audit that was done on our Singapore trading site. And I'm based in New Jersey. The auditor was based in Mexico City. So, and we were working on Singapore time. So we started at about 8.30 in the evening, East Coast time, um, and we finished at about 4 a.m. Um, luckily, we had a really energetic and great auditor. So uh, he kept things moving and, uh, and, and stayed awake the whole time. So that was, that was good. But, uh, you know, one of the, the thoughts I would have is as we are trying to navigate this more and more, we might want to think about, you know, sending the auditor uh, a lot of the documentation in advance. And perhaps if he could have gone through that in advance, it, and then maybe we just focused more on questions that might have actually shortened the time a little bit and allowed him to work more on his time zone. Um, and then I would say, you know, obviously the other challenge, if you're at auditing a manufacturing site or a warehouse, then you're looking, you know, there, there are certain things obviously that the auditor wants to see. And I know, you know, we're gonna talk a little bit uh, later about some of the um, smart glass and other technologies that could assist with that. But I think even, you know, even having a smartphone, you know, and a video, um, you know, in, in as Matthew said, in some of these more remote locations, having something like Google Glass may not be an option, um, but everybody's got a smartphone. And so there are, you know, we, we can turn that on the video part and, and let the auditor, you know, uh, direct uh, the people there as to what it is he'd like to see and and hopefully that could satisfy some of those things but um, I, I think you know in in all cases whether it's been remote or in person we've been able to make it work and achieve what uh, what the auditor was looking for yeah that's terrific excellent thanks Jean we have a little bit of time on this question you guys so Ashley Kieran Matthew um, you know, chime in on, you know, Kieran, I don't know, from a technology standpoint relative to sort of the auditing function, uh, whether that's something you can, you can bring to bear or Ashley. Uh, sure. Um, I think from a, just, just to, to take Matthew's comment um, earlier about um, technology being feed-based, it, it is very challenging in areas where you either don't have internet or low connectivity, but Thanks to the world of IoT and, and certainly um, low uh, communication uh, satellites, we do have the ability to consider how we can use real-time uh, outputs from uh, remote sensors, um, feed data, RFID to to deliver um, real-time audits and actually help actually achieve her chain of custody from basically from the ground up. So. Uh, from from soil, uh, from animals, there's uh, there's there's a, a lot of uh, there's a lot of low risk technology available today that can actually help drive the automation. Um, and actually, he's right; it does remove risk. That capability um, to remove risk then creates value um, and efficiencies throughout the supply chain. And, and when you look at, at the harmonisation of data. Um, using, for example, distributed technology, it does have that capability to to drive new positive economic behaviors from the ground up. Cool. Yeah. Matthew, Ashley, we have a, about a minute left. Yeah, go ahead, please. I'll just I'll just jump in real fast. I think um, from our side, we we've been looking at ways that we can allow and introduce more remote audits, in particular in at post production in parts of the supply chain where they're not handling as much of the material they're not repackaging they're not doing as much of that and it really is more of a documentation check um, this is another area where looking at risk and and understanding risk really really carefully will be a really helpful tool in using remote audits in a more targeted way so if you're looking at supply chains where they're not doing 
a lot of you know wastewater treatment for example then that's a lower risk in the environmental section so using that kind of information where it's not just a blanket you know we're going to allow this for everybody but we're going to really understand what the risk indicators are and apply it in a consistent um, kind of pinpointed way it's a great great tool to re um, increase efficiency well thank thank you ashley all right ryan let's um let's uh head off to question three yep perfect thanks um so obviously you know with with the way our supply networks are built and globally and complexity, it's, it's, it's hard to necessarily to know who and where your suppliers are. So as you look at this, um, and I'm gonna direct this to you, Matthew, because you referenced it earlier in terms of your supply networks and where they are and what they're doing and all of that. Um, so you can see the questions, where to, where to bottlenecks, what improvements would help, what solutions you touched on a little bit, maybe you can expand a little bit and, and certainly, you know, bring in the others in the panel. So, Matthew. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, for for us in particular, it's it's not even as much a question of visibility. We we have quite a bit of visibility um, all the way upstream, um, and often even hold those certifications for the farms um, and uh, and raising raising farms. Um, it, it's it's more a question for us is how do we start that verification process that that can sort of run all the way through the chain of custody um, and then work with Ashley at Textile Exchange and, and you know, other technology partners to, to try to make that as robust as possible. Um, as I kind of referenced before, you know, the, the, the margin of error is quite extreme. And, and when it comes to less scrupulous suppliers, or which there, I mean, there's thousands of down suppliers out there, um, it, it it starts to level out the playing field for the brands to understand. It's 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 very confusing for the brands to understand just how complex the 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 verification process process is. Um, and so for us, that's it, it's it's all about how do we verify as far upstream as possible um, and able to carry through that through the content claim, uh, you know, through the chain of custody. Yeah, I think I mean it. It just highlights I think this that the certification standards is a mechanism. I mean, you really, to do this, you have to know who your suppliers are and where they are. So certification almost essentially drives that and supply mapping and all of that. So um, open it up to the rest of the group for comments about, about this and bottlenecks issues and being able to use certification to drive visibility, uh, where are the bottlenecks and solutions. Um, I think if I can if I can help with um, understanding yeah. that um, te technology isn't a panacea, it, it does require people in process, and uh, I'm sure Matthew would appreciate and, and as well the panelists, mapping supply chains can be extremely challenging. Um, I actually refer to them as supply webs, um, purely because they're interlinked and they never go in the direction that they're supposed to. Um, so. Technology, in a, in a sense, um, uh, through distributed ledgers or through um, uh, simple technology such as text messaging or smartphones, it is set to drive positive behaviours on farm, um, whether it be for animal welfare, whether it be for environmental. Um, whenever you can visualise that, you remove the bottlenecks, you reduce the risks. Um, it, again, it's not a panacea, but certainly um, understanding a short uh, cycle would be beneficial to start at the beginning, um, go down at a farm level, see the environment, and then uh, take the information and be able to tell the story behind the brand, the value that actually is created on the farm. We're passion for, for, for growth of animals, livestock, and, and certainly the environment is given. Brands can utilize that um, certainly to add value uh, in their product and as brands uh, make their garments more intelligent and people start interacting with garments, um, wearable clothes, RFID, um, smart technology, it becomes, it becomes vital to be able to validate um, and give accurate information, building trust 
from from the ground up and and support the, the circular economy in this instance. Yeah, I, if I, I can just yeah, please ask. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just say it really quick. I just think that I absolutely love that point, Kieran, that there's so much value for the brands in understanding that transparency and understanding more of what's happening in their supply chain all the way back to, to tier four, super, super crucial. And there's so much value in the storytelling. And what we acknowledge is that we want the transparency that they need to deliver that to be incentivized and rewarded. And for it not to be a, a kind of a hammer or a punitive approach where you have to be transparent or we're not we're not playing that game, but rather that they have incentives, that they have rewards in place that really allow value that value to spread across the supply network. So it's not something that's just kind of happening only at the brand level. Totally. Yeah, and, totally. And, and and yeah, to your point to both Ashley and, and Karen, we we have found like a tremendous amount of value in in building that content with our with our brand partners um, at that at that tier four level. Um, but I, I think there's also an interesting uh, sort of anecdote that happens in our case, too, as we've been working with the farms in particular and helping them understand the value of what we're trying to do. We're a we're a low part of we're a very small part of what these farms do. Two percent, five percent the value of what they actually make their money on is is what we do. Yet we've been able to, with the help of textile exchange and, and the auditing bodies, actually go in and make significant change. They've also seen value. So I think there's also this case of these certifications are also able to uh, bring a sort of secondary value through the supply chain. Um, you know, we, we hear stories about farmers being able to, or slaughterhouses being able to sell their their uh, their meat for for more um, because they've been able to market um, these things and so it, it's it's not just like you know it's not just we'll talk you know we're talking a lot about value to the brands that are using the standards in our particular um, industries but but there's also a sort of like uh, side value here that that's that's created that 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 I think we can build upon too. That's great, Matthew. Thanks for pointing that out. That's super important. Um, so let's move on. We're going to move out of supply chain complexity and move into technology. I know this could be an active discussion and uh, probably largely rely on Kieran here to drive it, but of course the rest of um, rest of the panel, of course. So Kieran, I am going to direct this to you, but Ashley sort of secondarily to what technology solutions are in place right now or coming soon to help the industry with data collection issues. And I think we can expand that beyond data collection, but efficiency, credibility, all the things we've talked about, it isn't just about data collection, certainly important and reporting on the data. Um, and then certainly some of the things like blockchain we've referenced, I succeed, um, how, how, can, how can those help? So Kieran, sure. start with you. Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a great question, um, Jeff, and, and certainly the energy in the panel um, is, is very favorable. I, I guess from, uh, from a basic understanding, um, the, the term blockchain is used as a, as I said, as a panacea. Um, it's here to solve all ills. Um, it, it, it's not. Um, when, when combined with people and process, technology can be the most powerful enablement tool in the world. Um, just to give real world examples, uh, as Matthew had related to, um, we've seen um, producers here, uh, protein producers in Ireland, gain an extra um, 10 euro cent per kilo uh, for product that has been registered on a community chain um, where they're able to validate the animal welfare, show the feed um, and, and actually promote the lifestyle of the, of, of the animal um, and then present that to the consumer. So the, the emotional bond that's created through data um, and the ontologies and the story that is behind the positive nature of farming it is, is truly amazing. And, and when you take that into the textile industry, blockchain is one component that I believe is, is transformational when aligned with people in process. And as a distributed ledger, it removes risk, creates efficiencies, and automates the, the TCs, as we talked about in the first question, um, where you're removing the risk of um, paper-based um, anomalies or double entry or people forgetting 
um, you, you're driving trust from the ground up. But the value that's returned to the producer, so the person that's actually delivering the product, has to be in the value of the data and the value created at the top end. So whilst you can remove risk and create efficiencies, that, that ontology, that output has to be shared both up and downstream. And, and I agree, this is not a race to the bottom. I think one thing that COVID has shown is the reliance more on local produce. The fact that we are a small ecosystem of connected people, um, trading on trust is what brands do. Um, I think there was a famous car maker most recently said, um, the most important component of your car that we broke in our transaction was your trust. It wasn't the fact that that um, data was being manipulated. It was the fact that they broke the trust between the customer. And technologies like I succeed, um, as Jean has stated, um, put a, a, a great element of trust on the ground in that country to say, I'm connecting with uh, an auditor on the other side of the world who trusts me to actually carry out the instructions that I'm given. That data is written in an immutable, uh, transparent way that can be shared across the supply chain, which again, it, it removes risks and creates those positive behaviors. And as, as I said before, as we see smart clothing coming in, as we see um, young buyers and buyers very much caring about where their products come from, this is an ideal opportunity to use technology to embrace trust, create transparency, remove risk, and utilize the data that already resides within the system to drive positive economic behaviors from the ground up. Cool. Ashley, uh, some thoughts there too? Yes, I, I just want to say, Karen, that you described yourself as a nerd. I don't think you give yourself enough credit. That was one of the most beautiful descriptions of technology that I've heard in a while. <laughs> that was great. Um, Thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah. One, I mean, really beautifully said. There's not a lot that I can add to that. I think um, what Textile Exchange is, is looking at is how exactly how those what those systems can deliver and what their, um, you know, what value we can add to certification using those kinds of efficiencies. Uh, one of the things that we're, we, we're kind of breaking up how we look at the different technologies in terms of what they deliver on uh, the actual physical site validation, um, the, the, what happens at the, during the audit, for example, and then what they're, the, the flow of information, the, tr the actual transactional information that's collected in the transaction certificates, and then the physical verification of the product itself. And looking, if you look at all three of those in kind of a different um, lens, that you're not clumping them all together, you really can start to see, wow, blockchain is, it has huge, huge potential in capturing that flow of information, but maybe it's got limited, you know, there's, there are gaps in, in the on-site validation that we still need to make sure that we're covering. And then with the, you know, with the, the tracers that, that can provide that physical level of verification is really great and such a huge um, area of risk that we haven't really been able to appropriately or to adequately address, and that's a huge opportunity there. Um, and what textile exchange is kind of, you know, what we want to make sure that we're doing is that we're not, you know, exactly looking at blockchain, looking at any one technology as a panacea that that's going to replace and that, you know, we can just move to that system. But how do we um, make sure that the quality of information that goes into any of these ledger type systems is really, really strong and has been third party validated by our trusted auditors um, that goes through that really, you know, robust system that you have a really clean process you have trained people working on it um, and make that that system even more successful um, and so the, and the other the other piece of, of I think some of these different technologies is that centralization and one of the things that we're learning with the as we develop a right now a database for all of the certification information for textile exchange standards is that having that system where, where there is kind of a single source of truth for, for how the information flows through and whether it's been validated or not is really, really uh, crucial in the sick overall success of a brand coming up with a, you know, a policy. Because these brands are working with, in some cases, hundreds 
um, of materials across multiple different supply chains and for them to manage different IT solutions across all of those different materials, it's a, you know, it, it's pretty significant. And so if you can, you know, you know, that's a role that Textile Exchange sees ourselves in as a standards owner, that we want to make sure that for all of the materials moving through our system, there's coherence and that it, you know, that it, it makes sense. And I think that's a value that, that a, a standards owner or that certification can help add to those systems um but yeah we're really cool. excited about the next five years thanks ashley yeah and i know gene and matthew you probably have some ideas too and i think the next question is a good segue so ryan yeah so i mean we've touched on some of these things uh blockchain dna tracers uh uh you know artificial intelligence etc so maybe maybe in this case you know matthew and gene if, if you want to chime in here and kieran maybe you can support with your knowledge uh, on some of this stuff. So I wanna make sure, Matthew, you've done some things, uh, you know, track my down and Gene, if you have some ideas. So go ahead, you guys. Yeah, I mean, it's like, like I think both Kieran and Ashley have touched on it too. And, and, and Kieran so eloquently, you know, sort of discussed the, the issue of trust. Um, this is, you know, this is where, there also is a bit of a a bit of a divide here, right? Like we're the certification certifications are great, but we also have to bring that trust and that sort of level of transparency to the consumer. Um, whether that's whose role that is 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 uh, is sometimes difficult. Um, I think a lot of these technologies, whether it's a DNA tracer or um, any any sort of these really to I, I think the important thing is that is that everybody's working together here to reduce these efficiencies and then ultimately then the next step to bring it to the consumer um, you know that's where that's where you mentioned our track my down program sort of came in in no way shape or form does this you know does this take place of any one of the standards but there's a reason we launched it with the first year of rds certified products hitting the shelves we see it as a as a next step um you know as a next step because currently it's not as easy um for that consumer at that point of sale to see the mark see any of these certification marks and be able to in an engaging way trace that material back or understand more about that particular material and it sort of gets into another question you pose and we'll pose later about you know where about um you know what's next and 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 more along that sort of consumer consumer line and i brought it up before but i think it's a it's something that we shouldn't lose track right like certification is important but at this point you know at this point what certification are we talking about right like there's there needs to be a value for that certification for the brand to buy in we, we sort of end up in a in a duck or egg situation right which came first right is is the brand going to pay more for the certification and then market it or are they going to wait until it's marketed and consumers are driving that and but yeah i mean and i think and i think technology has a is a really viable sort of um has, has the ability to make that connection Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I mean, you guys, we have about seven minutes left on the questions before we get into Q and A, and want to make sure we're getting Q and A. But Dean, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to the next question and lay this okay. out because um, I think this is this gets back to what we were as I set the stage, but also certainly you've done some work on this and research, and Matthew you touched on it. Everybody's touched on it in terms of the consumer now in a whole new world, expecting, demanding the trust, the transparency, and traceability of these things. Um, so Gene, I'll start with you and, and you can weigh in on what you're seeing and, and how this fits in. Thank you. Sure. So what, what we've seen in our research and, and also looking at a lot of third party research, I think it's been pretty consistent. And essentially it's been really an evolution, right? And about 15 years ago, we started seeing consumers being especially concerned about food and what's in their food and, and particularly millennial consumers um, having a lot of concern about what are they feeding their families? 
Um, and then we saw that sort of move to not just food, but also anything you're putting on your body. So cosmetics, um, you know, are there chemicals in my cosmetics? What are they like? What are they about? What, what are they doing to me? Um, lotions, things of that sort. And then from there, um, it, it, it has moved into, um, now we're seeing it moving into apparel. But it's a little bit of a different sort of motivation. I think, um, you know, as um, the issues around fast fashion have come more to the forefront, consumers become more mindful about what, am, what is it that I really should be purchasing? What do I really want to purchase? Um, also, you know, microfibers in the ocean. So this has, um, and, and things like the, the fire several years ago in Bangladesh at some of the factories, so what we're seeing now is consumers are thinking about, you know, who's making my clothing? Um, is the company, is the brand that I am buying from, do they uh, essentially, or do they have the same values that I have? Um, and that's really important in order to build that trust, right? And for that brand. And then the last thing is, um, you know, as we see, um, you know, with apparel, it's it's more of a concern about what's happening to the planet. So not necessarily so much, you know, with food, it was what was happening to me and the impact on my body. But we're seeing more a concern about, um, you know, what is this doing to the planet? How much is going into landfills? Um, things of that nature. And that's really, I think, where two things, you know, come in. We're also seeing at the same time that consumers are very um, confused about sustainability. They don't, as it relates to apparel, they're not always sure what to believe, what is really sustainable. And that's where certification, I think, becomes so important and also having a very trusted brand. So if you can, um, you know, as a, as a brand caretaker, really, um, you know, ensure that you're focused on the right things, that your messaging is, um, is relevant to what your consumers are looking for, so you can gain that trust. But then pairing that with something like third-party certification um, really helps the consumer navigate, okay, this is probably a good option for me uh, in terms of in terms of apparel. So um, that's that's really what we're seeing on on our end. So I'd be interested to hear what the other panelists think. Yeah, that's great, uh, Matthew. I obviously you have a, a strong viewpoint on the end consumer. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, and I and I agree with everything that Jean said, and especially if we're talking. What's happening now with post-COVID? I think there's, you know, an increasing. Um, uh, I think I think the supply chains will be will be changing quite significantly. Um, I think we'll have to rely more on sort of like a diversified and localized supply chain, um, and so that becomes also critical um, when we're talking about these certifications and getting this messaging to the to the consumer. Um, again, I think that there's. You know, in, in in terms of the certifications we work with, we work with some competing certifications. Not only do we work with competing certifications, we work with sourcing initiatives that brands have developed by themselves. Um, you know, and so the question is is regularly passed to me, you know, well, why this and not that? Um, there's a lot of confusion over certifications, and that's where I think consumer marketing needs to needs to be addressed too at the same time we're talking a lot about what's happening under the surface but in a way none of this happens none of this matters really if the consumer doesn't sort of understand the value of that mark um, you know and and Ashley and I have had <laughs> quite a few conversations about whose role is this right we can we can do so much we're trying to do as much as we can with tools like track night down um, you know the brands aren't you know are the brand is it the brand's role to do it um yeah it, it i think it i think they're you know we need to rely on them to do it as well but i think it's also um as as we all change and and sort of out of a b2b model right like b2b communications are sort of dead they've long been dead if we're if we're thinking business to business marketing and communications we're a bit behind everybody's a consumer 
And so I think that it starts to change the role of the standards and some of the the uh, you know needing needing the standards to do you know to to be more consumer facing as well. That will help drive value. So when a brand comes to me and says, "Well, I don't want to pay thirty cents a kilo more." for this because I'm getting it cheaper over there, um, uncertified, you know, at, at a point they're asking me, you know, they're, they're having to ask the question, well, what's the value to the, to the end, end user? Um, certifications are important, but now it's a matter of being more granular and let's dive down. And, and to Gene's point, I think sustainability is part and parcel of all of this, right? We work mostly with animal welfare, but, you know, environmental environmental concerns need to be considered just as much i think with any certification um so we don't also run the risk of having to triple certify products yeah and i i can totally i'm, I'm going to jump in on that yeah there are such great points matthew and i think something that we've seen is that we we know that demand and certification is growing you know that's something that jeff alluded to for us it's been almost it feels a little bit like um like we're an overnight pop band that all of a sudden got really popular it took a little it's actually been about 10 years but so maybe not overnight but but where that i think where that's coming from is that consumers want a voice that they can trust and they want you know the brand speaking on their own behalf is is great if it's a brand they trust but in order for a brand to really build that trust they kind of need other voices to come in and speak on their behalf and we're it's interesting because i think that we're the next kind of targets for transparency and the fact that we have you know we have these systems we have chain of custody we have transaction certificates but it's not something that you can explain to a consumer you know over a cup of coffee yeah. even Oh, for an hour <laughs> you know when i try to explain what my job is to my friends it kind of takes a while for it to sink in and i think the more we can use some of these efficient tools of, of technology allow more of the tr the supply chain to become more visible to en enable transparency that storytelling that kind of consumer facing message the more that we're able to do that, then it, it exactly what Matthew said, it increases the value of certification, but I think it's also our responsibility and something that if we wanna stay, um, you know, we're, we want to stay relevant. We The whole reason we're in this game is because we want companies to use materials that are not damaging the earth and that are not damaging people. And so for us to really drive that value and to own that responsibility, I think being able to communicate what we're doing to consumers is is extremely crucial. Um, and it's I know that's an area that we as we grow, that's one of the for, you know one of the key places that we're looking is how we can build that consumer facing message, how we can partner with our brands that have those relationships with consumers to really up you know uphold what they're saying and give them more confidence. And, uh, and, to, to, and, to add, and to add to that too, just like the importance of this too is is that like it's our goal. Like what we want is to is to kind of identify those most critical certifications, right? I don't want like half of our supply chain is triple certified. We have it certified to this standard, that standard, and another standard, right? And that tr creates a tremendous amount of audit fatigue on us. So the more that a standard can sort of come to the to come to the forefront, the better. Yeah, that's great, you guys, and and a really good discussion there of an important topic. Um, we don't have that many questions. I'm looking at them, so I think in the in the few minutes we have left, uh, next slide, Ryan, please. To so maybe in each of you, like in, and I hate to pound it so much, but in 30 seconds, go. This is where we see this going: standards, certification, traceability, transparency. Um, kind of a brief, maybe in your in your ideal world. So, Matthew, start with you. Authentic storytelling. How's that? <laughs> okay, that's great. Yep, Karen. Uh, I'll take slightly longer because Matthew took slightly less, so I'll borrow some of his time if that's okay. Um, I, I do believe we're going to come out of COVID with a new set of values. Um, those values will be people-centric values, so authenticity uh, is top of this. But I'm reminded, uh, I gave a lecture in California two years ago, and I'm reminded, I, I, I asked uh, the student body what innovation was. 
and the response blew me away. They said innovation was answering the questions the future is asking. I think it's very clear from the panelists today they're already thinking of the questions that are being asked. And this, I have to say, thank you to um, to NSF and the panelists because through this, I think we're addressing um, innovation through answering the questions the future is asking. Thanks, Kieran. Ashley, oh, you need to unmute. You're on the unmute button. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I think Matthew and Kieran said it so well. Um, really authentic storytelling, asking the right questions. What we're looking for is um, a, a really that I think that consumer message and and really nailing down what's most important and letting the kind of the cream rise to the top, so to speak, that we're not getting you know bogged down by some of these other more uh, documentation and and that that type of thing. We're letting automation come in that we're you know getting faster in our system so that we really can focus on um, on on telling that story. And, and building that trust with consumers. And I, I would just say I think it's um, I think it's really mindful consumption. I think that's where the consumer is headed. Is much more you know they're going to be much more mindful about what they're purchasing. And so brands and retailers are really going to have to take that into consideration. And I think that. Things like certification and transparency fit right in there because they're they're helping to answer that need around you know what is this product and where did it come from and who made it um, and I think that's that's where consumers heads are at right now that's the kind of information that they're looking for. All right, excellent. Thanks, you guys, very much. I want to uh, spend a little bit of time on some questions. Again, we don't have many, but um, Sorry to those, well, just let me say that for any question we don't answer here, we'll get back to you with an answer. Some are NSF specific, so we'll we'll get to you on those. Um, question, are brokers the biggest challenge with supply chain transparency? Sorry, what was that, Jeff? Could you repeat it? Sorry. Uh, the question is, are brokers the big, one of the biggest challenges with supply chain transparency? So intermediaries that that transact on behalf of the brand into their buying and generally create lack of visibility into production. Do you guys, I mean, my take is yes, there, there is a challenge there. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll add to that, Jeff. And, and I think it comes down to relationships, right? Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't categorically say yes. Um, I think, I think, and, and I think this is also like, helps answer that future question too. Um, relationships are, are gonna be key and critical. With a good relationship with the broker, perhaps there is that level of, of transparency upstream. Um, you know, so, so I think it's, 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 it's more about establishing quality relationships and being able to provide those, the value of that to, through to the brands and ultimately to the consumers. Okay. And I would just add what, you know, what are your requirements for that broker? So, you know, maybe contingent upon the brands and retailers to actually make that part of the equation, that transparency. Yep. Okay. All right. I think we're, we're uh, uh, two minutes away. So I think we'll, we'll head into the, um, the takeaways and, and thanks stuff. So, I think just in closing, one, I certainly want to thank, you know, Matthew, Kieran, Ashley, Jean for participating and sharing your thoughts and vision for, for these important topics. So thanks to you guys. Uh, a note on a couple of takeaways for all of you participating. I mean, obviously we came into this with some objectives, some content that we hope informs and education inspires. So certification as a mechanism for providing greater visibility and transparency into all phases of production, that the standards as a means of reducing risk and providing assurance about best practices and are being employed in your supply networks. The certification can enable better firm and industry data collection and impact reduction measurement. That rapidly advancing technologies, blockchain, AI, 
I succeed, what have you, hold great promise to improve the assurance model. I think we can all agree the technology is key to a lot of what we talked about. And that the demand for companies to demonstrate increasing amounts of evidence of how and where products are made is only going to increase and the importance of driving trust with their consumers and suppliers throughout the entire network. So hopefully we've touched on those things, hope you understand this maybe a little bit better and can take things away back to your, your jobs, your work, uh, and be inspired to continue the work with certification. And obviously we're all in this together and you know we, we own it together, how we can make it better. And I think back to the survey at the beginning, I think we touched on all of those concerns that people have, but certainly um, cost and efficiency, 55% of you thought that was the number one thing. So I think as we move forward, we, we absolutely need to unpack that and figure out how we can drive those things into the system. Uh, and I know all of us here, Matthew, Kieran, Ashley, Jean, and certainly us at NSF and other stakeholders in the industry uh, realize that and, and the future I think is bright for us. I think we should all be optimistic. So with that, um, I think Ryan, next slide, just a brief, very brief take, you know, kind of close for us. Uh, a little bit of questions came came through on what we do. So yes, we we audit and certify to all of the textile exchange standards as well as our own traceable down. We also have a host of consulting services, largely around climate, whether it's CDP reporting, science-based targets, regenerative agriculture, we have a whole host of services that we can help you with in uh, consulting and helping your work on climate change. Um, thank you again to everybody. Very grateful uh, and appreciative for your contributions. Anybody has any questions, issues, follow up? That's me. Have a great day, everybody. Have a great evening. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Gage. Pleasure. Thank you. Uh, pleasure being with you. Thank Thanks, you. Bye. Bye.